24th. Call the selections meeting to order. Everyone please join me in salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First up is public input. We have any public input today? <coughs> no. Good. Next, we're going to do a review and approval of minutes. These minutes are for the meeting of Monday, April 10th. I had contacted Canley with a correction, which she made, and nothing jumps out as me as being. I'll move we approve with this. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, next order of business, I have to declare a public hearing. And this public hearing is to accept state and local fiscal recovery funds in the amount of $253,244.24. This is all part of the American Recovery Act. This stuff can be used for infrastructures, etc., and trying to help us out with the losses and the difficulties we had through COVID. Any public inquiries or anything on that? Is that an addition, addition to what we had gotten? No, that is what we've got. Or that is. Yes. We just never no, got it. We never accepted it. Yeah, we never accept, we spent it, but we haven't accepted it. <laughs> okay. If I see no other uh, input, I'll declare the public hearing closed and have a vote to accept these funds. I'll move to accept the funds. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving right along, we have our fire chief, Adam Thompson. Come on down. Thank you much. So in addition to the updates. I have uh, a couple other things to go over um, after this. Um, one of them is uh, in reference to the generator at the Melvin Station. Um, a uh, call member, as far as acceptance, and the full-time position that uh, that is up for that. So currently. We've had uh, 150 calls for the year, 50 fire calls, 73 EMS calls, 26 service calls, and one special detail, 13 furnace, uh, gas furnace inspections, one oil burner inspection, two wood pellet stove inspections, and five life safety for 21. And you can see as far as the totals where we were at in 2022. Um, Not far uh, off. And I think that it's, it's pretty close. If we had some good weather um, in the past <coughs> couple weeks, we probably would be right right there as far mm -hmm. as in the numbers and stuff like that. So, um, four seven twenty three, we did a missing person search from the snowmobile trail at Castle McLeod to Canaan Road, and that was on the snowmobile trail um, mm -hmm. that is uh, that runs that area. Did we find the missing person? Uh, the missing person showed up the next day, as far as it goes. Okay. Um, I did not notify you as far as uh, with that because it was a police thing. Yep. But if you want to be notified in the future, if you don't get notified, just let me know. Well, if we've got people out, it's probably a good idea to let us know. Okay. Um, investigation for illegal outside fire, 237 Middle Road. Smoke investigation, unauthorized burning, 8 Little Bear Island. And smoke investigation, unauthorized burning on 16 Waterbury Island. 
So is <coughs> outside burning still off the, off the menu here? Uh, no, no. <coughs> we looked at that burning ban some time ago, okay. and we never stopped all the burning completely. It just, as far as the category twos and category three permits were restricted. Um, the campfires, they were still allowed to, to burn. Um, it's going to be really bad to, uh, to shut them down. If the state shuts them down, then, then we'll shut them down. But as far as the, the bigger brush fires, uh, bigger brush piles, yes, that it was. But things have greened up really well. We've had rain, and uh, so we're, we're up, and, up and running. Um, Austin Esme transported the Easter Bunny to Camp Sentinel for the town Easter egg hunt on 4-8. He stood by at the event until uh, it was complete. He is a <coughs> um, firefighter EMTR, um, so if anything was going on, he could, he could call that if anything got hurt or anything like that. That's nice. Thanks for covering that. Not a problem. Um, Dennis had asked if we could do that. Does it turn out to be a big event? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We originally he wanted it in a fire truck, but obviously the road postings yeah. had just got lifted um, before we had talked, and it didn't make a lot of sense to take a heavy truck up into that. So we wanted with one of the smaller ones. So the five bay doors at Central <coughs> Station were maintained on four six twenty three, uh, cost of two hundred and thirty five dollars. Boat one has been placed at Pier nineteen for the season. Uh, do you know of a timeline as far as any work being done? No. So no. right now, uh, there's it. there's nothing to worry about. No. Mm. Nothing at all. Just no. As soon as we get a whisper, we'll let you know. Okay, great. Uh, as, as soon as you, you get to that point, then we'll find it a home and, and go from there. Have you uh, got any locations that... Uh, uh, we had been offered uh, as far as right across from there, we would have to figure out as far as um, <coughs> power or whatnot uh, for it. Uh, but there is an area that is uh, kind of like fenced in. It says no, uh, you know, no docking right there at the end. On the opposite side, they had uh, the association had offered that um, at one point in time, but that was that was last year. Um, so I'm not sure if that's still. On the, on the books as far as it's be able to do. But we'll follow up with that. All 18,000 plus feet of hose was tested um, by 11A Fire Department testing on 412 2023. Our four inch supply hose all meets NFPA standard besides one 100 foot length of hose is missing the required safety box. We're hoping to purchase uh, at least that one length of uh, hose um, by the end of the year. And a couple of the small lengths had failed, but nothing that we, like we have in the past, so we're, we're in pretty good shape this year. Do you do this every year? The testing, yes. yes. Uh, there's, there's no way that the department could even remotely test all of the hose in a, in a year um, say nothing about in a day, and then pack it all back mm -hmm. into right. everything that needs to be done. They do a very good job. Um, they probably do a better job as far as packing the homes back into the trucks and stuff like that than um, mm -hmm. some firemen do as far as it goes. They, they do it every day. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and it, it's a, a third, you know, obviously it's an outside company, so if anything does happen with it, it goes back to them as far as the testing. Uh, the department ladders were tested on the same day with the same company. Everything was fine with those. Myself and chairman, <coughs> myself as the chairman of Osby Valley Mutual Aid and Captain Chris Morgan met with New Hampshire State Fire Marshal Sean Toomey and Hazmat Coordinator James Stone regarding the Carroll County Hazmat Team, uh, where I'm the chairman Obviously, um, the hazmat team, as far as things like that, fall under me. And right now, the hazmat team is kind of defunct. And so we're trying to see how to get them back, you know, on the feet, so that the area, as far as Tuftonboro and the other towns, um, have 
hazmat coverage um, and that hopefully we don't have to pay a significant amount um, to have that coverage. Um, but I'll uh, keep you abreast of that as it, uh, as it goes. A Stewart's Amulets representative um, was at the Tupperware Central Station on 412 giving out pre-COVID tests. 178 tests were giving out uh, to uh, people between 12 p.m. and 3 p.m. The fire alarm system at Central Station was tested to include heat smoke detectors, ventilation detectors, and strobes, horns throughout the station. This test will be completed uh, every year by night security uh, from now on. No major issues were found. We had a meeting with Camp Belknap in reference to the new dining hall on 4:11:23, 1 p.m. and 4:17:23, 2 p.m. at the Central Stations. Those in attendance was Chief Thompson, Captain Pike, Captain Morgan, Director Seth Kessel, and Maintenance Supervisor Matt uh, found. The second uh, meeting was on the system that they're going to be putting in um, for the dining hall, for the sprinkler system, um, and to go over the design uh, for that. Uh, the first meeting was in <coughs> reference to um, the building design as far as uh, Doing a, possibly doing away with the sprinkler system underneath the building uh, if it was uh, coated with fire uh, resistant uh, material and uh, some other uh, plans as far as the building wise. We do not currently have a complete uh, set of designs uh, for the building but that's supposed to be coming uh, within the next couple of weeks. So we're, we're working with them in reference uh, on that. So, uh, on uh, 4 15 2023, Matt Fuller was uh, traveling to Concord for Firefighter 2 um, class, and in Barnstead, a, uh, a turkey struck car one on the hood and caused $1,079.10 uh, worth of damage. That's with a 10% discount of $119.90 from accidents happen. I haven't been able, I haven't uh, received a second estimate from uh, Westerns yet. Uh, they were supposed to email that to so me. So the 1079 was the total price, or was it 1079 uh, less than 119 uh, 1079 uh, looks like that's with the discount. Ten was with the with the <coughs> discount, so it's over a thousand dollars. With the discount, it would have been without the discount, it would have been another one hundred nineteen dollars. One thousand one hundred ninety dollars. Yeah. So, um, my question is: Is that something that the select board uh, wants to see repaired? where it's going to be replaced in the next couple of months or how much of a deductible do you have? A thousand dollar deductible. I'd say no. So it, and there's no safety issue. And the hood opens. Uh, it just obviously it's taken a thousand something dollars off the value because it needs the hood replaced. I don't know. So this would take that much off the replacing the hood? Yeah. Yeah. There, <clears throat> there's three layers of metal in that so that they can't pull the dent out. We, we had a, a guy that uh, um, does that on, on vehicles and he's like, eh, no, you got to replace the hood. And each of the places that I went to said, yeah, that's a, that's a hood replacement. So. Yeah. I'd say leave it the way it is. Yeah. Um, if what I'm seeing for damage is what I'm seeing, which I'm not even sure that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. <laughs> It's just that little dark spot. Yeah, but it's the dark, it's indentation. I mean, it's a yeah. it's a pretty good indentation but. for a, a bird. Um, but no, but it could it couldn't have been good for the bird. <laughs> <laughs> nope. No, 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 no. Uh, no, if we're gonna replace it anyway, let's let's leave it. Okay. Yeah, I mean. Our deductible is a thousand dollars no matter what, so yeah. that's what we're yeah. what we're looking at. No. Um, down to the next item. Um, we've. 
had a uh, gentleman by the name of Philip Selesky of 42 Rocky Point near Lake New Hampshire um, that has come into the department. He's been to a few of the, the meetings. We've been working on doing background check uh, checks as far as uh, checking references and uh, um, driving and everything has come back negative. Mr. Selesky has been a call member of the Brookline Ambulance for since 11 2022 to present and the Brookline Fire Department from 2002 to present. So he's been part of the Fire Department for, for quite some time. Yeah. He just got his EMT uh, and their ambulance and their um, Fire Department are separate agencies as far as it goes. So Mr. Celeste <coughs> is currently selling his home in Brookline and moving to his residence in town. All his references obviously Again, have checked out. Criminal motor vehicle driving records are negative, and no issues with either. Um, all of his people that I have contacted, as far as uh, his chief there, um, gave him very good references, um, and uh, for that. So, um, do, do you have? Do we do we make a decision of it, or is I? Or does the chief make the decision? According as far as. Uh, with whatever, I, I make a uh, recommendation to it, and you make the final decision. Is that what you're doing now? Yes. Yes. So yes. Your, your recommendation is to bring him on board? Yeah, as far as a call member. I would move that we accept the Chief's recommendation. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And I will give all the proper paperwork uh, to who it has to go to as far as uh, to get him situated as far as mm -hmm. sworn in and, and all of that. Uh, the other, well, before, before we get into the, the full-time position, there's a, there's a couple of other things that I didn't uh, um, write <coughs> down. that I had a question with, and they're fairly simple. The Parks and Rec has asked us to um, put this uh, lasagna dinner item on the, uh, the signs, and uh, the one issue that we have as far as putting it out is that it's fairly in depth. So, by the time that the sign, you know, you get whatever on the signs, people are, people are gone. By. So I, I just wanted you to know that uh, um, we're probably going to say no with this particular one. Mm -hmm. um, because that it's just, people are going to like wait and wait and wait to, to see everything that goes there. And it could so it's be not a, just issue. one screen. Yeah, it's not one screen. So um, if you have a complaint that... Um, we didn't do that. That's that's why, um, you know. As far as town meeting, as far as voting, that was all very simple. As far as uh, you know, road close, all the different stuff is uh, um, a little bit easier uh, sure. than that. But when it gets to the you know, the more complex things, we might not. You know, people are gonna not pay attention to the signs after after a while. Yeah, and even if you put that out, lasagna dinner May six, five to seven, set in the lodge. Uh, that's a lot of stuff to put on right. those little signs. And if you don't put set in the lodge, they're gonna think it's at the fire department. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's last. It's right. Right. it's too late. It's a lodge. Whoops. It's <laughs> Get into generators while you're yes. here. Okay. Get that. Get that right out of the way. So in front of you uh, is uh, all three proposals that I had received last year in reference to uh, the generator at the Melvin Village Station. I have the original proposals if you need to see them, um, but this is a, is a copy of them. 
Uh, and also, it's a proposal from our current uh, White Mountain Propane and Oil Company that uh, is delivering our propane. So the three proposals um, in order of when I received them I was the first one was received by uh, for Scott Thompson, uh, electrician. Uh, it was received on 11 10 of 22. Uh, when I talked with him, he had mentioned that he wanted to give a $2,000 um, donation to the fire department, which would bring that proposal proposable to $7,200. Um, and the other issue that he had, the 13 kW, um, is no longer available, and he would be going up to a 14 kW generator for that. The, uh, the next one that I received was uh, generator connection on 1208.22. Their proposal was for 97.50, and that was for a 12 kW standby generator. Um, it didn't give a <coughs> brand. The other two were Generax. This is Core. This is it Core? It says right in front of 12 kW. Oh, okay. Yes. Sorry. Sorry about that. <coughs> and they do they do maintenance uh, cola at uh, our um, radio site in Wolfboro. So the the last one received on uh, 010423 uh, was uh, Tim Christian Electric, uh, 10kW twin cylinder uh, generator for 7200. I have a conflict with all three. So it's not something that uh, that I can make the decision on on this. Well, I wonder why um, Christian put in a 10 kW and then got a 14 from Scott Thompson. We had 13. I mean, well, we asked for a 13, but he well, he, we we didn't ask for a specific size. number size. They all went to the site. They all looked at the site, and they all made their decision as far as that goes. So okay. one, one went with 10, one went with uh, 12, and one went with a 13. Well, generator connection is highest. <coughs> and and uh, Scott and uh, Tim's, are, at the end of the day, they're the same price, right. but Scott's giving the uh, bigger <coughs> generator. Well, Scott would be installing a 14 kW generator where um, yeah, Tim would be ten. installing a 10 kW generator. Where do you see 14? Well, Lance says 13. Yeah, but he said that they don't make the 13. 13. Oh, yeah, okay. they don't make the 13 anymore, so <coughs> he's going to go up. Early stage <laughs> dimension. <laughs> no, no so issues. So without the, I mean, without the $2,000 donation, he's at 92. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, I guess we'd assume that would be the cost for it. Um. And uh, in my minutes, um, I had uh, put that uh, Thompson Electric installed the town office generator, town house generator, and transfer station generator, and does the current maintenance on them. Um, Tim Christian installed the generator at the library. We have no, no control over that, and that doesn't fall under us as far as town-wise, they, they continue with that and as far as maintenance. And generator connection maintains the large generator to such a station uh, through our contract yearly. So they're all working for they, us. They're all working for this. Yeah, that's why I have <coughs> that's why I have a issue with making any decisions with that. And under the uh, the proposals for the propane tank. Um, if we own the tank, mm -hmm. it would be $4,160. If White Mountain Oil uh, and Propane owns the tank, uh, the 325 gallon above ground tank, it would be $960. If you were installing an underground tank, I'd say we should own it. <coughs> but above ground tanks are fairly easy to swap out if yeah. you end up switching. And they seem to do that on a regular basis. They do. So. And the 
refresh my memory on the water. What was the amount on that? Uh, I had put in enough to cover the highest um, generator connection and this four thousand one hundred sixty dollars. So do we have the it was like fourteen seven thousand like that? Mm-hmm. $14,250 is the amount of Warren article. Seems like so we have it covered. If we, and we're not burying the tank, is that what you're saying? That's correct, it's above ground. So that's the $960 price? Yep. Right. And is there a annual fee on that or it's just sort of I haven't uh, that was uh, that would be a question that I have. Yeah. Um, they didn't put anything about an annual fee. I know that I have a hundred and fifty dollar fee um, through mutual aid as far as with the tower site because we don't use that much propane and it's tough to get to. Um, so I'm thinking Maybe there is a, a annual fee with it, but uh, that's nothing that uh, they had showed in the proposal. This is going to be tested on a regular basis. Oh, that's another question. An automated transfer switch <coughs> doesn't automatically test the generator weekly. You have to add a timer. Yeah, the, the, the generator has to. You have to add a timer onto it, or you have to do it manually. Yep. But most of the ones that I've seen. It's only a few hundred dollars to yeah. add a timer to it, which could be done after the fact. Um, well, we're only spending eighty one hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, there's plenty of money. Yeah. Of a warrant, so if you need to add something to it, yes, you can. So why not, Mr. Chairman? Are you ready to accept the motion? Yes, I am. I would uh, I would offer a motion to award the generator installation to Scott Thompson for the amount of seventy two hundred dollars, and to White Mountain Oil and Propane for the propane connection of $960, not owning the tank. Do I have a second? I'll the second the, I want to have a discussion. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Where's the donation coming to? He, he said it was uh, <coughs> to the fire department, but it's, it's obviously to the town if it's taking off that, uh, that amount. Um, is that something that uh, you want to make contact with him to see where that is before you vote on well, that? If, and this, so the discussion's got to be, we're ended up, we'll end up cutting the check for the ins installation for the gross amount. So it would be 9200 bucks, And then he's going to cut a check to us that's going to go back into the... Uh, General fund. General fund is revenue. And that's really the only way we can give him a whatever tax deduction he's looking to get. Or if it goes to the fire department, he's still going to want to check for this, the whole amount so he can get the two grand back. And I don't know how else he can do it. Seems simple enough to do it that way, as you suggest. Yeah. We pay him. I mean, we're still well. Out, we're we're still four. Oh, grand well out, within four grand under the Warren article. So yes. It's not as if we. <coughs> have to muscle it around. So I'm looking at the bottom line. And. Uh, well, the bottom oh, line. Oh, just, 
is going to be $9,200. With a $2,000. The two thousand dollars is going to come in separately. I, I need a rebate, so <coughs> so, so we, we're going to we're going to award a contract on a gross appropriation. Right, right, and we can condition that on the two thousand dollar donation or discount. I guess we need to talk to Scott about it. If he wants to discount the product by two grand, or yeah. or does he need the two thousand dollars for? A, Oh, or we do it for the seventy-two hundred dollars. We pay him seventy-two hundred dollars. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. Well, it works if he's just discounting the product by that much, but right. it doesn't right. work for him. Right. So we probably should talk with him. That's the discussion I'm having. But either way, I'm happy with Scott Thompson. So yeah, so we want to do it. I think we ought to have Scott come in. Decide how he wants to, how we're going to do this with him. I think we can still go forward with the award. Yes. So we can vote on the motion as it stands. All right, and then we'll ask Although, him. I'm, can we have it? That motion? changes the uh, bottom line then. But the, my motion wouldn't work then. I would have to change the amount. We'll right. Do it. Do you withdraw your second? I'll withdraw my second. Uh, <laughs> and I withdraw my motion. Alright. So let's invite this <coughs> Thompson in. That's the easiest right. way to do it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Invite Scott Thompson into the next meeting, please. Got it. Sounds like the easiest thing. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Just so it's clear to everybody that. Yep. And I'm not out of it. So. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. And then we got her. So, like, when we're going yeah. to add something, a, t a timer or something, we're talking about? Oh, yeah, I mean, it should, it, I mean it, should, it should have a timer. It's probably only going to amount to a couple hundred dollars, right. and it should be, um, it, it's, there's plenty of money for it, but I think, I think there should be an automatic timer on it, because that station is not staffed right. uh, full-time. Okay. And, and that's something that could be asked at the, the yeah, time, and if, it, 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 needs it has to, it there already. you got to you got to test it weekly. Yep. <clears throat> All the others, uh, you know, including our central station, uh, that 100 kW uh, propane stacks up every Tuesday at like one one o'clock, just like clockwork. Okay. Item that uh, from the the phone, as far as uh, cell phone company, um, looking at putting our equipment up on the tower itself, as far as it goes, they wanted us to sign a zero dollar contract, as far as uh, to be able to put the equipment up there. Is there a way to have the town attorney look at that contract sure. um, before anything is done? With Absolutely, with your. Yes. Okay, um, and is that something that goes to Cami? Right. That, yep. uh, that yep. she goes through. She can forward. And um, they are going to mount the antennas and things like that, but they wanted to have this contract, which is a, apparently a, a thing that they do all the time with uh, um, the towns and things like that, um, in place before anything is done. And this is in addition to the contract we already have. They already have in place. <coughs> and they are, um, they are going to hire someone to actually put those antennas and stuff in place um, yeah. because it's cheaper for them to hire it out than to have the guys come back and And as far as, uh, um, I know that obviously you have appointments that are after me. Um, is the application for the, the captain um, 
something that you want to discuss later on um, after you have the uh, the other appointments. Well, we need to go. I think we need to go in the non-public. Yes, we should go non-public. Okay. And I do have one scheduled, and we could add another after that. So that would be quite a while yet. But yeah. If you don't mind. No, I, I have no issue. Great. We'll do that. Yeah. All right, for now. Super, thank you. You're welcome. Next up, we've got Tim Galvin on a couple of three different items here you'd like to talk about. Feel free to jump right up, Tim. How is everybody? Very well, you saw. Not bad. Kimmy. Yes. Well, it's an afterthought of listening to your conversation on the generator. I would. Second, think the timer on that generator. I think you're in much better position to have somebody physically go run the test because the place is not manned. And experience has told me over 20 years if the machinery is going to screw up, and sometimes they do, it's better to have somebody there seeing it, listening to it, and knowing it's screwing up when it's screwing up so that it doesn't cause other damage. Just that's why I have remote notification. I mean, I monitor seven generators for the county, and we have remote notification. The ones that are up on the hill, um, there's a cell signal that sends out a signal if it starts. It sends out a signal if it tries to start and fails, all of the above. So there are, there are ways around that. Of course, that would be up to Adam, just, how, how he wanted to manage yeah, that. Yeah, just hearing the, the tidbit. So, so thank you. Okay. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to hit on. Uh, I've had some conversation with uh, Steve Wingate. I understand he's uh, giving up his seat on the LRPC. Um, we've talked about it. Um, and I've indicated that that might be something I'd be interested in, in filling until it, something else changes. Uh, so uh, my understanding is there needs to be um, after a vote or whatever, notification to the LRPC itself. Uh, yes. But uh, if the seat's open and you need somebody to fill it, I'm happy to occupy it for a while. All right, on that, I have a, a notice of appointment. Here it says that uh, there's a vacancy in the office of the Lakes Region Planning Commission Transportation Advisory Committee. I was not aware that Steve was on the advisory committee because our representative to the advisory committee on transportation has been Lloyd Wood for many years. And we also have an application to reappoint him to that. Yeah. What position are you trying to fill? Uh, uh, as I understand it, uh, Steve is, <coughs> is the, sit, occupies the commissioner seat for the town of Tuftonboro on the Lakes Region okay. Commission. In that case, we would have to have a, a notice of appointment that said that and not the Transportation Advisory Committee. That appointment was the, all I changed was Steve Wingate's name to the new one. So that's what Steve's said. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I don't know, maybe you want Very to interesting. reach out to Steve, but if the, if the <coughs> commissioner's seat is, up, is vacant and you need somebody to fill it, I'm happy to occupy it. And that seems quite reasonable. For the time being, okay. I think I'd, I'd hold off on this until I can talk to Steve and find out exactly what his or position is. Lakes Region Planning. Yes, somebody <laughs> that knows what's going on here because I'm confused. Who's doing the work? I'm going to go pull the letter. All right, that sounds good. From that. Meanwhile, you have uh, some other things you so, like to yeah, talk about. Then the other thing, uh, simply, uh, I saw the ad for the administrator role. Yes. Um, I guess my question is, have you guys put some parameters around that yet, or was this still kind of a, uh, let's toss it out there, see what happens, see if anybody replies to it? This is a toe in the water kind of situation. We don't have any funding to do it this year, for example. We've had one resume, which I have here, brought in, which seems to be quite extensive, but it was a toe in the water is what it is. Okay. And the reason that I, I even brought it up, um, and I know there's time yet, um, it might be something I would also consider. But I, I wanted to have better clarification from the three of you in terms of 
um, what you've got and for you know parameters around this, or mm -hmm. it's really just pie in the sky at this point. Well, I think we can fund it. I'm not concerned about finding money to pay somebody to do what we've asked. But I, I think I have an agreement that we haven't really fleshed out exactly no, what, the, what the job description is. We were sort of looking for responses, and the indication was that we weren't going to get any. So we didn't spend a lot of time well, fleshing it out. So as of today, we basically had two responses, haven't we? Right. So, so I, I guess that's the, you know, I'm trying to make an educated decision uh, on, on what I may want to do with that or not. But if there's no clarity, even from you guys, in terms of what you're trying to accomplish on a part-time basis, it makes it hard to make a reasonably intelligent decision. Well, having That's, two interested parties, I think we're going to have to sit down and make some clarifications on it and get a, a real strong outline of what we, what we expect. Right. And we are going to have a work session on Friday, which might be a good time to sit down and do that, and we can get back to you with that. Okay. And I appreciate you, uh, your interest. Okay. The, um, the last thing, which is uh, probably a little more complicated, I want to talk about the dump. But I'm going to preface this um, by saying I am not looking for a fight. I'm looking for some clarification. Okay. Um, at the candidates' night, I made a couple of comments about uh, a communication concern based on uh, two specific chemicals. And Chip, when you responded to that question and concern, you started out by saying, and I'm going to quote you, let me clear this up. That is not true. So my first question is, what is it that you think I said that was not true? There were, I, you have to give me a hell of a lot more information than what, what you've given me. I mean, are, we, are we talking about this supposed seat? We're talking about the test. I'm talking about the test wells, and I'm talking specifically about the PFAS and the 1,4 dioxide. Were the two so things the that I PFAS that I mentioned. We are currently under subpoena on the PFAS, along with every other town in New Hampshire. We have no records to substantiate whether or not, no, whether we accepted any, and we didn't accept any PFAF chemicals. What I said, what I was responding to you about was this notion that we're doing nothing about polluting the environment up there, which is totally false. Well, that's, we, but that's not what I said. What I said was I was concerned about an apparent lack of communication, particularly between the Board of Selectmen and the Conservation Commission, because I had had conversation with the folks at the Con Conservation Commission asking if there was any plan in place for testing uh, from the wetlands out through towards the aquifer. If there had been any discussion with the Board of Selectmen on that question and the CIP, and I was told no, there was not. And that caused me to go do a little bit of digging. And, and so when I heard you say right off the bat, what he just said is not true. We are testing. I, and I'm not going to litigate the candidates night with you. I, I'm we not are interested, testing. I'm not interested we, in litigating. We are testing the total perimeter of the, of the property that the town jointly owns as the landfill site. That is being tested twice a year. We just got the test results back from Santec, I don't know, not too long ago. Well, yeah. I, I've got last April's. I've got last April's tests. Okay. Okay. And and the reason that I brought it up uh, was because we, one of the things that that made me a little bit nervous when you said, "Let me clear this up." That's not true. Is because last year's test results are pretty clear that the PFAS or the one for dioxane or above the state mm -hmm. levels. And, and so the implication being interpreted out there was that 
this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, and, and that we're not polluting anything. Well, the old results that the town had said differently. So I just wanted some clarification on what it was that you thought I said that was not true. That was the first question. The second question was, you indicated that the, that the wells are, are tested continually. Now, according to the permit that was issued going back to 2019, they're done uh, once a year, and a couple of them are done every other year. The same data is on the, is on the face page from the contract with mm -hmm. Stantec. So to me, there's a difference between one time a year, some are, are odd years, and some are every two years. There's a big difference between continually and that spread. Really? Yeah. Then that's your problem, not my problem. Continually means from the date of that contract, every single year, since then and on into the future, is going to be testing. So from my, my interpretation of the word continually, we're continuing the testing program. We've never abandoned the testing program. Maybe it's not as extensive as you would like. If the Conservation Commission is concerned about pollution heading out through the Great Meadows, that's all conservation land. They have never brought a proposed testing regime before the selectmen. It's no, not, in, in, in my term as the selectman's representative, the subject has never been really breached. Well, I've been, I've been here for a long time, and I've never had them come forward with a testing regime. Um, didn't, isn't that part of what they brought forward in that proposal from Sanborn Head in, in 2019? In 2019, Sanborn had put, put together a program. At the request of the, at the request of the CONCOM? No. The Conservation Commission never made that proposal fixed with, with the selectmen. They never brought that forward as an additional expense that would the, the selectmen would okay. have. Okay, I, I had different information. This is why I want to have the conversation. Yeah. I had different information. I was I mean, told... If they want to bring it forward again, that's fine. Okay, I was told it was brought forward. <clears throat> no, they were, they were members of the conversation that we had when the testing was renegotiated in 2019. Okay. <clears throat> and they have their information from DES to support what they want. All right. But also, I, I, and you know, we're talking five years ago. I don't believe Santec recommended it, and the other company that we were looking at at the time didn't recommend it as being necessary. Okay, that, that may or may not be. I'd have to I'd have to reread it. Um, okay, um, a couple of questions relative to the current permit, if I may. Okay, um, the permit that is currently in existence um, suggests well, it states clear out. Um, the permittee shall not cause groundwater degradation as a result of the surface water standards in any surface water body. And so my, my question then becomes, where all of this seep is allegedly happening, mm -hmm. uh, that is going into the, I guess it's the pond that's still within the GMZ or the GWZ or whatever it is that they refer to it as, the boundary line of the, of the dump. Uh, is there any testing of that, of that pond that the leach, wetland? Yeah, that leaches out and eventually goes into right. the. I can address that. Area? I've been there and looked at. The, there was a well there to test. Yeah, but is is. Is the pond being tested? Well, the well is six feet from the pond, so I I would think that. If the pond was contaminated, the well would pick it up. But that's just, I don't and know that anybody has drawn a sample off the top of the water or anything like that. It's not to my knowledge. The seep, if you want to call it that, was directly tested by, we had that done by Santec when Did we you? first heard about it. And that must be before I was in the Oh, yeah, it was, way, it was like four years ago, yeah. five years ago. Yeah, I think it goes back to about five years. Okay. 
Um, that, that's kind of what I was curious about. Um, I wanted to understand where the lines were and what was or was not. That's why I preface this by saying I'm not looking for a fight. I'm looking to understand because I've spoken with, uh, I've spoken with, uh, what's his name, O'Rourke, and I've spoken with uh, Ed Kenderson, who, who heads up the groundwater division. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've got a pretty good understanding for how things are situated. What I didn't know is what I don't know is because I, I'm only going, you know, I'm only going on a reactive phase here and, and looking to understand and sort of chasing the chase. Uh, but I've got sort of a vest, vested interest in the in the one four dioxone results and the and the PFAS results, uh, and and I think it's worth flushing those questions out. Well, the one thing you have to remember when you start fleshing things out is what are the consequences? Well, and I, I, our leadership has always been, with regard to the closed landfill, DES. They have the scientific expertise. They, have, they require us to do things. We hire professional engineers to test things. The point I was trying to make was, until those professionals tell us there's a problem, we're not going to try to look for a problem. Okay. And so if, if there's, I mean, you're concerned about PFAF, everybody in the world's concerned about PFAF, nobody knows what to do about it. And the last thing we want to find ourselves in is having to remove that closed landfill at the cost of tens of millions of dollars. And it would be. Yeah, well, and that's, so, I agree with and you. And that impacts every single taxpayer. So <laughs> our primary function here is selectmen is to manage the affairs of the <coughs> town. And we have to do that. And I think, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. And I think that this is, this is a situation where it behooves the select board to not be simply reactive to the minimums of the permit. Because the permit places some pretty expressed responsibilities <laughs> on the permittee, i.e. the town. Uh, and I think it's... It's in the best interest of everybody if, if the selectmen, even if it's in concert with the, the Conservation Commission and the CIP, are talking about and, ha and planning for ways to do additional planning. Because I can tell you this, within the next year, you are going to see specific water quality standards for PFAS and 1,4-dioxin. And, and that's going to hit this town like a ton of brick, like it's going to hit a lot of towns like a ton of brick. But they are coming. There's no question about that. And they're coming probably, the, my last conversation with the folks at DES is the, the rules, uh, things will happen the end of this year, mm -hmm. and the final rules will be some point next year. And so when I look at the specifics of the permit, and I look at the areas in question, the only answer I can, that I come up with is the town doesn't know what the answer is because they're only testing the specific wells. They're not going any further out. And I think we're now at a point where the prudent thing to do is to have those conversations with CONCOM and CIP and look to begin to establish how can we fund additional testing so that within 12 months, 14 months, when the state comes back and says, by the way, Tufton Borough, we're changing your permit again because now we have specific standards for PFAS and, and whatever the other P thing is that everybody's up in arms about, in addition to the 1,4 dioxane, we're not caught by surprise because then you are going to be in, you know, a, a big dollar millions of dollar cleanup mode. And that's a conversation you need to have with the Conservation Commission, not with us. And the, the requirement's going to be put on the town to discover if it's an issue. I think it already, and has, I think it already has been. I th actually, I think it or when you say that, uh, because I, one of the, the 
things in the current permit. It says the permittee shall maintain the water quality money program uh, and notify DES no later than 45 days. No, that's not the one I'm looking for. Um, that's your standard. That's your standard testing. Um, there's one that there's one that applies to uh, number nine. Within 30 days of discovery of violation of the ambient groundwater standards or beyond the groundwater management zone boundary, the permittee shall notify DES in writing. And within 60 days of the discovery, the permittee shall submit recommendations to correct the violation. So if you're, if you're collectively being more proactive than just testing the minimum wells to get ahead of the curve, I think number nine places a responsibility on you to do that, to be proactive, specifically to be proactive. That's your current permit. Okay, our current permit encompasses just the landfill site, the transfer station property. So probably what would happen is we end up testing more often the wells that we currently have. To expand beyond that is more than that permit can require. And so But the permit doesn't the permit doesn't limit you from doing that, is I guess the counter. Are you telling us we're not in compliance with our permit? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying <clears throat> that that the permit that the permit places some some very specific responsibilities and it also gives you the flexibility to go beyond what just the permit is is saying. Keyword flexibility. Keyword. Uh, but the, the reality is, if nobody knows what's happening in the wetland waters, even though you're testing directly from a well that's six feet from it, you don't know what the answer is. And I would say, even though that's within the, within the GMZ, or whatever it is that they give it a designation as, if you don't know the answer, I know this, having worked with DES for 20 plus years on lots of different water permits and air permits, their response is going to be, well, you should have known. That's always their response. Their reaction to, to uh, enforcement is always reactive. It's not necessarily proactive. So if they get a complaint or if they find that you're in violation because somebody complained about something, then they come down like a ton of brick. But even the conversations I've had with Jamie O'Rourke and, and other folks higher up, there's nothing in the permit that would prevent the town from taking a more proactive stance to get ready for what we know is coming. And what we know is coming is specific standards, water quality standards for the PFAS and the one for dioxide. So you're suggesting we go out and look for a problem that may or may not be there? I'm not suggesting you look for a problem. I'm, I'm suggesting. I think you are. I'm suggesting that perhaps you want to look at mitigating a potential liability exposure that's for surely going to come within the next 14 to 16 months. That's what I'm suggesting. You guys can do what you want, but I, I can almost guarantee you, <coughs> because you've no, we've known about the PFAS problem in the one for dioxane since Jamie O'Rourke wrote this letter in 2019 to Chip when he was the board chair in, in 2019, in December of 2019. That letter tells us that we've had a PFAS and 1,4-dioxane problem since then, since before then, actually. So knowing that it's been going on for a long time and knowing that there are new standards coming, a prudent person would say, we probably should look to see how we can mitigate and get ahead of the curve so we don't get caught. That's that's my thought. But there's just as good a likelihood that they're going to change the water quality standards to accommodate for the PFAP issue that's extant within the state. I mean, I'm not prepared to put Tufton Borough ahead of any of the communities in the state that also have chemicals in their landfill that came from somewhere they didn't know where they were coming from. I mean, there, there's over 100 towns that have been subpoenaed by 
chemical companies who manufacture PFAP who are being sued by the state of New Hampshire. And they want the towns to accept the responsibility for the pollution. That's, that's their game plan. And I don't think the town should have to accept that. They didn't create the chemical. No, they may have not have created the chemical, but if if the town accepted the chemicals into their into their landfill uh, and and allowed for it to go on, they sort of own the, the liability. No, okay, but in two thousand nineteen, this started to become an issue. Maybe in two thousand fifteen, it was in the in the heads of DES types and, and chemical engineers. It was not a public problem prior to that in the minds of the people out here who are drinking the water. It's only just surfaced. I mean, this whole PFAP thing has just started. It's so recent that I don't think DES even knows how to deal with it. I mean, okay. how, what are you going to do with it? If every landfill in this state is contaminated with it, where are you going to put the stuff? Yeah, and, and it's a legitimate it? question. You know, but I think it? by the same token, knowing that, for example, the 1,4-dioxane is an EPA-listed carcinogen, and if that mm -hmm. shit is getting into, into the water supply system and is getting into other people's wells, and it's originating in that area from those, those test pits mm -hmm. that the town has known for a long time that it's, that crap was coming out of, I'd want to be ahead of that curve. I'd want to be able to defend uh, the liability exposure. And I don't, personally, I don't think you can do that right now because you don't know the answer. You don't know if that is reaching the aquifer. You don't know if it's getting further than the GMZ. You don't know if it's already in the wetlands and if it's coming from the dump. And that's the problem, is that you can't answer the question. And so I think it's... But you can answer it at any given point in time. And that's, that's the... That's, that's, and that's to go, and, that, and that answer is to go test. Right, but you can test at any point in time. You can test in the spring during runoff, you can test in the fall during low water. Yeah, but we're not doing that, that's no, the no. point. At any given point in time you can do that. What, what I think I'm agreeing with Bob is that we're not going to create a problem or look for a problem. If this comes up and there's some issue that creates liability for the town at that point in time. Because we can't stop this infiltration or exfiltration of, of PFAF. It just isn't going to happen. Well, no, and it's not just the PFAF. Or right? any of them. I mean, how, how would we contain it? Well, that's the purpose of the GMZ, is to contain it within that. Yeah, but it, I mean, I, 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 but that's, a, that's a theory. How do you physically contain this? There's no landfill in New Hampshire that's completely impervious or no, self-contained. No, there isn't. I agree. So if we can't contain it, then the issue doesn't... There's nothing we can do about it until someone says, okay, you've got to test the water down Melvin River. So we'll test the water in Melvin River. Well, I guess we can, we can respectfully agree to disagree, I think, to... To say we're not going to we're not going to do anything about it, and we're going to take the view of we're not going to go look for a problem that doesn't exist. The problem exists if we're going to stick our head in the sand because we don't want to deal with the potential exposures, or we don't want to deal with what the cleanup costs could be five years or ten years down the road. Okay, that's your choice. I think that's a bad decision. I think that's a really bad decision. What's the next headline going to be in three months, six months, three years, six years? And then what happens to everything that happened before then? We're, we, you're going to continually find yourself in the same position uh, based on the next headline. I'm not sure I agree well, with that. And, and more importantly, I, there's no guidance coming out of DES on this at all. I mean, when we got subpoenaed, we asked for guidance, our attorneys asked for guidance from DES, and there was none. So I'm not certain you're feeling that they're going to actually come up with a water quality standard that addresses this issue. 
immediately. I don't know that that's true. Well, I can only tell you what the head of the groundwater division yeah. just told me. And is that the, the rules, they hit gel car this fall, and they'll be finalized within the year. So when the guy who's responsible for doing it, or getting it on the move, is telling me the standards specifically to PFAS and 1,4-dioxane will, will be final ruled within the year, I have no reason not to. But we don't have any idea what that level is going to be. You don't have any. I certainly don't have no, any. No, I agree with that. So let's wait and see what those levels are. Let's, and then maybe we do have some issues that we need to address or some liability that we need to, need to protect against. But I'm not really, the, I'm only a member, one member of a board of three, but I, I certainly wouldn't vote in favor of spending money and creating another pool of information that gets misused uh, because it's, everything's available to the public that we do, everything. I mean, aside from personnel issues. And I mean, I look at the testing that happened with the seep at the location of the seep where we actually had it tested by Santec and came back with not an issue it's just not a very sightly thing. Yeah, well, but that's I, all of a sudden all over the internet again, thanks to Mun Citizen. And there's nothing we can do about that. You know, they can take whatever information that they want to cherry pick out of this operation and use it however they want. Yeah, and the iron in the manganese looks awful. Like, as soon as it hits the air, it turns that yeah. creepy orange, goopy yeah. looking stuff. That's fine. I'm less concerned about that. I'd be more concerned with the things that we know, based on existing testing, already exceed the state thresholds, i.e. the PFAS and the 1,4-dioxane. I mean, that's in your last Right, report. and there's nothing they can do about it. Reports. If but there were something that they knew that we could do about it, they would have us do it. That's the point I was making at the candidates' night. If there was something that we were doing wrong, or some test that was coming back ridiculously negative that was really going to impact people, they would tell us what we needed to do to remedy that. There's been no information coming from DES on that part. None. They've never said, okay, in your report, it shows your PFAF, PFAF levels are X and they should be no more than R. These are the remedies you need to take to make that go away or, or to remedy that test that came back negative, if you will, or came back over mm -hmm. the limits. There's been no recommendations from DES in that regard because I don't, they don't have a recommendation that they can make. <coughs> right, well, and that's, that's the point I just made. The, the, yeah. Those standards for PFAS and, and the 1-4 will be out within the year. That's what they're telling that, All that's going to do is tell us what's, how, how much we may be over the standard. Yeah. That's not the solution. No, it's not the solution, but it, it, that's, that becomes a different level. I, I, hear, I understand yeah. you. I agree with you. If there's no guidance, yeah. there's no guidance. But I still, I, I still stand by the point that it doesn't prevent the town from at least having discussions with CIP and CONCOM <clears throat> to begin to make sure that what's coming out of those wells isn't spreading and, and creating a larger potential liability looking at us coming down the road. That to me is just being prudent. Well, it's... Uh, you, you guys can do what you want down the road. We're going to have conservation in again. They'll come in for their monthly report. Yeah. And we can speak about it then. Yeah. Especially if uh, we make a note of it. See what they got to say. How we're gonna if, if yeah. we go forward, your uh, what you're thinking about is my last three years in heavy construction was building groundwater pump and treat stations on closed landfills. It was super fun siting. Had to run for years to do it. 
maybe there's a way to do something with it. I don't know, but I understand your concerns, especially and what it could end up costing <coughs> yeah. the town. It, and I gotta be, yeah. I gotta be candid. I would have never got on this whole subject, except for a comment you made, Bob, at a budget committee meeting the night the ConCom uh, presented their budget, because I had no idea that the Great Meadows sat on top of of the largest regional aquifer in the area until you piped up about them doing that. That was common knowledge. Doing the chemicals. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. Uh, and that's when, when you said that, I thought, you know, holy, you're talking about, the, your question was about chemicals for the invasive vines. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, it got me thinking, and I asked a couple of people a couple of questions, and that led me to something else, which led me to something else, which led me to, why is there no conversation here between these things? And why does why don't people seem to know what the what the numbers are in terms of the testing results, mm -hmm. um, which brought us to the candidates night. And, and when I heard the, uh, essentially, what he just said is not true comment, I thought, what the hell is going on here? Well, and so, uh, you know, I wanted to have the discussion, uh, frank, open, honest, to understand. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad we, I'm, you may not be glad we did this. I'm glad we did it. Not a problem. I think it was helpful. I actually appreciate the effort you put in. You get all this, hey, you're a concerned citizen. You're doing something. You're not just doing other. All right? So I do appreciate your efforts. Thank you. If you're all set. I'm done. All right. Time for supper. <laughs> Our next appointment is with Jim Rines from Horizons Engineering uh, to speak about 19 Mile Beach. Come on down, James. How you doing? Good. How are you? Uh, hang on, you know. Good. So I, I got the pictures. I didn't. I couldn't get contact, so I just swung down there quick to look before I came back. It looks like the. I don't know if it was ice push or if when they were plowing or what, but it looks like right at the end of it where it stopped at the water line. It's been pushed back, and I don't know about the the end of the wall. It was pushed off. Looks like it got hit. That's what I was thinking. Um, so I don't know the the. Uh, it, do we know? Do they plow that? Is, is well, the uh, ice houses go out that way. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah we the, ice, the town doesn't plow. No, I, mean, I understand that. I'm just whoever is out there that wants to go out on the ice plows it. And you know, frankly, the, the movement and that, uh, I don't know what you call that, silly really confined gravel there, those. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that looks more, that appears to be ice damage. The heaving? Yeah. yeah. I, yeah just, that's, that's, it just appears to be heaving. Yeah. I don't, think a, I don't think a single plow could come along and take a chunk of frozen sand and substrata and, and cause it to heave like that. Right. Yeah, I saw I saw some blue. I didn't know if it was paint or if it was scags off of a, a snowmobile or what no, that, that that uh, was in some of mm -hmm. that. I didn't know if it was a plow or. But either way, we got some fixing to do. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there was this. You can you can see the, the blue in in there. Yeah. That's, that's, that's right where it. It's in a yeah. few places. Right where that heave is. Looks like somebody dragged something across it. Yeah, and I didn't know if it was they dragged a plow or if it, you know. Condo size ice houses. A fish house. Really? Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean. Sure is there. That could be the bottom of a plastic sled. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Blue well, snow plows aren't too common. I picked, you know, I picked some of it up to try and, try and tell what it was. And I the the end piece um, there where it, this piece here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yep. I was just going to look at the plans. I didn't remember that being part of the, the spec, but I think it was just a way to try and tie that down. Yeah, just to be converted. To Cellularly confined gravel. The purpose of that was the state, I think, 
You, nobody lo launches boats there, correct? No. Yeah. Boats. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that during the discussion was that the state, if it's not designed to not compact, the state wants it porous, or they, they consider it impervious if you don't make it porous. So we did this to make it porous um, as a demonstration of trying to infiltrate more than have it run into the lake. And uh, so, I, you know, that's the... Uh, so how do we make it stable and porous? Yeah, well, that's a good question, uh, Guy. Uh, I, you know, I, as I was looking at it, typically if, if it's a boat launch, they have concrete logs that they use and they go right out into the water, but that's going to that's going to encourage people to launch boats there, which I think is my understanding from before was something that we wanted to not encourage. Ooh, absolutely mm -hmm. not, uh, because obviously it's a swimming area and that's a boat launch, right? Well, away. does there have to be anything solid there? Can it just be sand that goes into the water? Well, we, sand? we can we can ask the state. They didn't, you know, they. They don't like sand running into the lake because it adds phosphorus and yeah, other things. So every single I, I, beaches run into the. If I understand, <laughs> I, 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 I'm just telling you what what we have to do to get permits. But I'm not I, I'm huh. not disagreeing with you. But, you know, there's sand all all around the lake, but uh, when it <laughs> when it runs into the lake, it it ca carries phosphorus and. Okay. Yeah, you can use clean wash beach sand and get a permit for every 20 year replenishment. Yeah, you can do yeah, every six years. You can do <coughs> up to 10 cubic yards of, of sand for replenishment. Right. And we've uh, done that before down there. Right. So, so I mean. Maybe we, we change it from a ramp to just. Yeah. An extension of the beach? A the drain beach? somewhere here, you know, French drain. And just some steps. You know, yeah, I mean the broad. Steps I, I remember the discussion at the time we were doing it with from the conservation commission, and uh, was that they, you know, people they wanted to make sure, and the town they wanted to be sure that people could get on and off with their bob houses and sleds, yeah. um, and so. Well, I think DES didn't like live sand there, you know. Right. And so we were like, well, maybe we can, we, this cellularly can combine gravel works, works good in driveways and things. But I think if we don't give them a way to get onto the, onto the ice, they're going to find a way. Right. Exactly. That and that was the that was the pitch to DES is, hey, you don't, you don't do this. They're going to, you know, they're going on. Mm -hmm. There's no one way, way to, one way or the other. Um, and well, going on and off presents its own problem because, and I've always complained about this, they relay so much chemical sand and salt, whatever they call it today, on that road, not necessarily from the end of my fence or further up, end of my driveway all down through it, it gets caught in the tracks of the uh, vehicles, you know, in the treads of the tires, <coughs> and they go out there and they deposit it right in that area at the end of the right. launch, and it deteriorates to the point that they can hardly get in and off there within a month of uh, end of uh, fishing season, or when they're supposed to be off. They try to move over towards the brook to avoid that melted area, and as a result, they're going to clip the end of that uh, berm. Yeah, which is... And I've watched that happen <coughs> uh, with, with the road saw, and you're gonna to have to stop anyway. So why are you going down that road so damn fast? You just got to be aware that if you're gonna turn left and go out onto the lake, you wanna kinda of figure you're gonna drag some road salt chemical out there and some years you go out twenty feet and it's unsafe to drive. And it's perfectly good ice left and right of that particular area where they're driving on. So I think a, a mitigating uh, feature would be to either stop salting beyond where the cl 
plus five road ends and before you get into the parking lot because uh, that'll help alleviate the discoloration of the snow to brown and the sun effects that it's going to melt, going to melt it open. Well, I'm pretty sure that they don't salt down there. Oh, give me a break. There's, I know that we mix enough salt in with the sand to keep it from freezing, but I can't imagine our road agent going down there and putting salt down. They do it on the way down plowing and they do it on the way back plowing. Sanding. What's in the truck? Sand. Not pure sand. No, I told you, there's enough salt in there to keep the sand from freezing. That's, that's well, it. Well, yeah, right. But no, they don't pure salt. No, 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 not pure. No, it's, you don't okay. have pure salt right. anywhere in the town. But the mix <clears> they have <throat> is you're picking up brown sand mm -hmm. and a specific whatever <coughs> amount of road salt. And you're depositing that when you go out onto the lake in that area and it opens up. Right, I agree. And you can't hardly go left. You've got to go towards the brook towards the end of the uh, on-off season to avoid that, that trench. I mean, a lot of people get get hung up in there. You got to be hauled out by their buddy in another truck. And just to yeah. observe. Okay. So yeah. what do we do? Well, I, like you said, I, I just looked at it a couple of minutes ago. I haven't given it a lot of thought, other than clearly what's there now isn't working. Right into right right where it humps. It looks it looks good as it was approaching it, but then right there where it heaved, it was it was coming apart. So it was it was sort of serving the purpose until it really pitched down, and I don't know we could. Well, right now there's quite a trench from the end of that uh, granite end yeah. to the water. I mean, right. it, it dug out. Pretty yeah, good. yeah. We didn't we didn't show a granite sort of stop or anything there. We just showed it being cellular all the way down. But um, I don't know. I didn't look at, to see a depth of that because I, I was afraid I was going to be late to the meeting so I didn't I just went down to look at it. Well, would it <clears throat> I mean if we put a granite stop at the bottom of the ramp? On there's the there's one there now Chip. Uh, let's, let's see if yeah. So that that's what the, that's there now. Yeah. That's quite a ways from uh, I mean Oh, you mean down in the water? Yeah, yeah so, right so to the water. They, yeah, you can see it there for him. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That the, this piece right here, is that the granite, the edge of that yeah, granite? This, yeah, this yeah. is, that's the end of it right there. Yeah. So it's, it's like it, you know, if you, from this view, if, if you look at it, the, 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 gra the, the cellularly confined gravel is pretty good right until that hump, mm -hmm. and I don't know if the hump was from the <coughs> from the uh, you know any ice pushing on this big piece of granite that caused that stuff to heave up, or if it was from. from I have an eight-inch well tile at the end of my fence, buried within the stone wall of the lake, and that tile got pushed in with the ice ice out this year, eight inches. Yeah. My fence did not fit in that well tile and I did not have the wherewithal to push it back, can't push it out because we push the stuff into the lake. But that ice out this year was a visit to the ice ages. It came right up, Paul, once you get that moving, it, forget it. Sit back and watch. Yeah, I mean, I don't so I'd, I'd like to noodle on it a little bit, but I, I now understand what the, what the issue is. So I might talk to DES to see what they've, you know, if they've had any experience. I know, it, was it, it was it all right last year and this year? There was some damage last year, but not as severe not as that. Not as pronounced as yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. Like he said, I think the ISO increased the Mm -hmm. the, the damage to it made it more apparent. Oh, it, it, it totally looks like ice damage. Yeah. And 
And I, I, I was thinking, gee, if you put, if, if you put in those concrete logs that they use for um, boat ramps, that those go out into the lake a ways, and so that if it was going to ride, at least it would ride up it rather than hitting that mm -hmm. that right. piece and, and mm -hmm. kind of pushing that piece. But I remember I, I was at Piper's Point uh, down at Lakeside at Winnipesaukee and uh, saw a piece of ice coming in. It was probably from here to Jack's office, and it, it was it, it looked like it was going about this fast and. I, it looked like you could put your foot out and like stop it. Like a locomotive. It. Well, it looked like you could put your hand out and stop it, and it hit a rock, probably the diameter of this table and about six feet high, and it moved it like eight or ten inches, just, boom, yeah. just pushed it. And I was like, boy, glad my foot wasn't between there. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I know that if the ice comes in the right direction, it certainly hydraulic it, power it would, is it would hit unstoppable. You know, hit that. Hit that slab at the end would cause that yeah. that cellularly confined gravel, you know, at the end to to hump. So yeah, um, you're going from a solid surface to a porous surface, and right? And I the, and yeah, the, I, I can talk to DES because the permit's good for another year, so you can still do work under the permit that exists. Good um, to know. How far out the lake can you go? Well, it would be a, it would have to be an amendment yeah. because we had to stop this above the water line. Yeah. That was the so if you so you'd almost have to do it like a ramp, and then I don't know if you would want to uh, put a bollard in the center, you know, have a like a pipe a slot where it could be put in so that people wouldn't launch boats, and then you could take it out in the winter mm -hmm. for. Um, for the ice season, it would be open for ice season or something. But yeah, makes sense. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. But I certainly don't think we want to encourage people boating. Uh, no, boats. no. But that you know, that's if if you put that sort of ramp situation, everybody's going, oh, it's like we can launch here. Now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what's. Fan be out there hollering at them. Yeah, that's kind of what's rolling in my head. But I want to want to chat with DES, see what they've seen. Right. So, Sounds good, and obviously you'll get back to us and yep. schedule up an appointment and see what's going on. Okay. Thank so, you. Don't Sounds pull out any more hair than you have to. No, I, I don't have any more to pull out, I, I, so that's why i got to keep it short. That's right. I will. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I learned a long time ago that we don't actually lose this hair. You grow up through it? No, it just migrates to different parts <laughs> of your body. You're coming out the ears and your back. My father always told me that he grew up through it. <laughs> God only made a few perfect heads and the rest he comes that's with right. hair. Grass doesn't grow on a busy street. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next up would be the signature file. Thank you, Jim. Yep. Have a good night. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye. All right. <clears throat> First on the list, we have an abatement recommendation from our assessor. This is for lot number 46-3-07. And it is to deny an abatement for the address of 192 Mountain Road, where the application is uh, what I'll call a book all about MX-171. Uh, I've had a chance to look through it all. Uh, there's no news to me in this request for the abatement. I don't know uh, if you'd like to look at it, Chip, or not. I've already looked at it. Okay. Um, I'd like to see if the chairman can find out where those pictures were taken. That's not the seat that we studied. Uh, this is actually about the racetrack, not about... No, if you look at the, when it gets into the uh, emails, or not emails, the, I don't know, Facebook or whatever, there's pictures huh. in there. And the only reason I ask is that, uh, I'm going to dig it out. Yeah, I, 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 I haven't, I've never seen this location, and I'd really like to know if it's one that I've seen has a test well right beside it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I will. This. Whoops. Yeah, I've seen these pictures. Yes. Online. Yeah, but I've never seen when. 
I've never seen that spot when we went out and looked at the seat, as it were. Okay. And I just, if that exists and that's on town land, I'd like, personally, as a selection, I'd like to know where it is so we, we could. Well, you have seen the one that has the test wall. Yeah. 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 I just, and maybe it's the way the picture's taken. I don't know. I'll look into that for sure. It has nothing to do with the abatement. Right. No, that's okay. <laughs> while, it, while it's on your mind, I know. I otherwise, it's, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty familiar with the area since my family owned it uh, long before the town stole it from my cousin Fred. So. They didn't steal it from Fred. <laughs> um, I'm going to make a motion that we deny the abatement. I will second that based on the fact that the, our uh, assessor. assessor has recommended such. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next up we have a land use change tax bill. And this is for tax map 2-2446, it's 153 Mountain Road, two signatures required, tax collectors filled it all out, everything seems to be in order, I'd make a motion that we sign. Second. All in favor? Aye. And this is a two signature and it's a print and signature. That's for my benefit because I always do it backwards. And we have another land use change tax bill for tax map number 16 2-9 149 Sodom Road pulling a lot out of current use all in order make a have a motion to sign this and the penalty for bringing that out? Two hundred dollars. So the whole value was only two thousand dollars. I want to take it out. That's what it says here. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like a motion. So move. Second. I'll, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's also a double print sign. And then we have what I believe to be, yes, this would be a uh, veteran's tax credit near and dear to my heart. GD214 is here, everything, all the paperwork is in order. So moved. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. This is a yield tax levy 
for tax map number 43-1-2. Big work appears to be in order and approved by the tax collector and the assessor. Two signatures required from each of us. Like a motion? So moved. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Once again, we have another yield tax levy. This is for tax map 50-1-31 uh, and 32. I'll move that we sign that. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yet again, another yield tax levy. And this is for tax map 45-1-18. And attain a motion. So moved. So a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, something different. A gravel tax levy. <laughs> and this one is for two sections of the tax map. 55-3-3 and 22-455-02E. A motion to sign. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good things are opening up now that spring is upon us. Gravel tax levy. So you get to map 66-2-70 and maps 22-455-08E. I'll move we sign. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we're getting busy with gravels and yields. Once again, gravel tax levy. And this one is for map number 67-1-3. I have a motion. So moved. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Intent to excavate. Lot 55-3-3, that was the gravel tax levy, I think we just said. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit behind. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Notice of intent to excavate. This is on, does not tell me. It's the 66270 for the gravel tax that you just signed. That's not the one. This is one from uh, on Sandy Knoll Road. I don't see a lot number. Oh, sorry. My mistake again. 66-2-70. Motion to sign. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Just as an aside, that was actually the first legal pit in the town of Tufton Road since the, they changed the regulations. It's very interesting. Okay, once more again, we tend to excavate. This is lot number 67-1-3. Uh, I have a motion. So moved. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Last but not least, a notice of intent to cut wood or timber. Map 67, block 1, lot 2. I have a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Action items. We're cordially invited to attend a marker dedication at the Grave by the Lake on May 3rd at 11 a.m. to Melbourne Village Community Church. And the tax collector expects to see at least one of us there. Well, that's a Wednesday in the middle of the day at work. I won't be there. I shall not either. Maybe Chip will go. I'll try to make it. <laughs> He's, uh, I'm not. This is an action item. All right, this action item is from the Lakes Region Planning Commission asking if you want to reappoint Lloyd Wood to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Lloyd has expressed his interest in continuing. Lloyd's represented us very well in that, I think, over the years. I'd, I'd like a motion. So moved. All for that guy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. At least we know exactly what that one is. Yeah, I don't know what the other missing piece is. I'll find out. Next we have the uh, description and all the details for uh, proposals for the 19 Mile Bay crosswalk advertisement. Cammy's asking us if we were approving this and says it'll go in the May 4th edition of the Grand State News. We're going to need to put an end date on this proposal kind of situation. Do you think four weeks is sufficient hmm. to, to bring in? Well, it won't go in until May 4th edition, so that's, okay, yeah, that's coming May 4th. So. so you can either end it on the 19th or the 26th of May or the 2nd of June. I think giving it a full month would be good. I, would, I wouldn't do it any earlier than June 2nd. Okay. So you can you can look at the bids on your meeting at June 5th. June 6th. Fifth? What do you mean June 6th? Is that the date that we're Fifth. Oh, it's June the 5th. I can't see it. Is it Monday? I don't know why I'm saying that. Trust me, it's the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we want the proposals to be in by June second. Yes. Okay. All right, I'm going to write that out here now. Yes, I'll please. Thank back you. Back to Candy. Mm -hmm. The second one is the is basically the same idea with all the specifications requirements for the sprinkler system <clears throat> for our town offices. And would you like to keep the same date on that? Uh, I think go longer. That might go a little longer because it's going to require um, a mandatory site visit. Absolutely. So I think we, we should add a couple of weeks. Let's call that June 16th. You don't meet on the 19th, so you want to do the 23rd? All right. June 23rd? Because you meet on the 26th. <coughs> okay. Yep. That's fine. Well, I'll go back and I'll return to Kim. All right. We have a memo from the police chief who's here. After all his investigative work, he would recommend that we go with the Malton Tahoe SSV price, if they still have any left, and if not, 
the McMullican Tahoe PPV. And it says here, from what I was told by my governor McMullican, they're going quickly. Part of the reason is Ford raised the price on the Interceptor Explorer SUV to more than the price for a Tahoe. So many departments, including some larger ones, are switching. McMullican has shipped four to Florida a few weeks ago. Last week, Central said they only had three Ram 1500 SSVs left. Do you have any? You have two listed here from the governor. Right. That, what's, the, what's the difference between an SSV and a PPV? One is special service vehicle, the other is police pursuit vehicle. Uh, the difference is the tires, the wheels, and a few options on them. The one we have, the black one, is an SSV, special service vehicle. The other two are PPVs. Um, the PPV has like a 19 inch tire on it versus or 20 inch wheel. The other is like an 18. It's um, the it, difference in price between them a little bit. Uh, one is pursuit rated and the other one isn't. The one sits like an inch higher, the SSV sits like an inch higher. Are you more concerned about clearances on some of the roads and driveways we have around here? Or are you more concerned about high-speed chases and cornering and whatnot? Not, not real concerned about high-speed chases and cornering. We have a pretty strict pursuit policy. Um, the SSV is a little cheaper price-wise. It's a little bit offset because we have to get some things a little different. But it's, I think, the better price and it will match up pretty close to what our most recent one. So you could very easily put to use that few hundred dollars that we saved by going with the SSV? Yeah. Yeah. You, you'd be happy going with that? Yes. That's what I recommend because it it's cheaper. It'll match up with what we have and I think it'll, um, it'll fit in. And uh, that's the one I would recommend. And, uh, you and, have and, and it's easier to get tires for the SSV versus the PPV because the tires for the PP, winter tires are, um, there's like two options or one option for the PPV because it's an odd size Okay. because they have to be pursuit rated and it's a weird size. Well, there's a difference of almost $500 here, so I'm going to make a motion that we allow the chief to proceed with the purchase of the uh, Tahoe SSV from McGovern for $43,292.25. Would you like to second that for purposes of discussion, Selectman Alding? No. <clears throat> Neither would I. I'm not ready to get into the police car business yet. Have you found a replacement officer, Chief? We're going to work with that shortly. It's in correspondence. Yeah. <laughs> but you can speak to it if you'd like to, Chief. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're, we're um, <clears throat> have one that's able to make the uh, next PT test. Uh, we have another one out of the eight. We're down to one that can make it on the six for a PT test. We have one that is um, has contacted us since I did that memo and said he could do a PT test in June. Um, and that's it. Out of the eight, the other six have either not responded, had bad emails, bad uh, telephone numbers, or uh, have found other jobs. So of the two that you have, mm -hmm. how confident are you that you're going to get one of them? I'm not. You're not. I don't so know. So what, what's the justification for the cruiser? Well, if we don't get it now, we can't get it later this year, probably. Right. I mean, this is, there's a window, and that's it, you know? Yeah. Secondly, um, we do, I do have a part-time officer that's, very close to being coming forward uh, to being presented to you. So there'll be somebody that can work some hours. Um, and we don't have a car to put them in? We do. We do. We, we have the Explorer. The, the truck has right. to come off the road, I believe. Just sitting here in the parking lot the other day, a part fell off. But That's nice. A big chunk fell off 
it, where a bolt had rusted through. It was rather significant bolt, which caused me concern. Um, there was a weight. But we yeah. have two inactive cruisers currently. Yes, we've had one as including, a spare. Including the one that's falling apart on the parking lot. Right. We've had one as a spare, which has been very beneficial. We've had one in the shop or getting repairs or right. something down. And if we don't get this vehicle now, we may not get a vehicle later this year. And it could take some time to get it equipped, as it did before. Right. Um, but as far as applicants go, we're... Um, I don't know how it's going to fare. I mean, it's a tough market. There's not many people applying for many jobs, and there's a lot of openings. Uh, I believe Osby has more than one. Moltenboro, I talked to the chief the other day. He has six. He's got two he's going to be filling hopefully soon. Uh, so it'll be down to four openings. Moltenboro has a couple openings, I believe. So it's all around, and it's tough to fill them. There's not many people applying. Which doesn't mollify my question about the, the cruise. I mean, if, I mean, until, I, I just, I'm, I'm not convinced that we need to buy a cruiser this year. Neither am I. I mean, we've got, even, do the, either of these candidates that you have need to go through the academy as well? Uh, one would need law package, one would need to go through the academy. Okay. And I say law package because I can't get a definitive answer until they actually the application package is put right. in. But I most likely, one of them who will be here on the 6th, I believe, would not be much more than a law package. The 6th of May. 6th of May, yes. I take a chance and wait. I mean, I, maybe they, they won't have any cruisers left, but I kind of doubt that. What if um, I'm I'm speaking ahead of asking you any questions? What if what if the chief agreed to get rid of the two oldest cruisers, two of them, the spare and the one that's falling apart in the parking lot, and replaced it with one new cruiser? Just throwing it out there. Um, <laughs> we haven't heard that offer uh, from our chief, so I'm not ready to do the yes or no. I mean, is that something you'd do? I suppose, I mean, it has been a benefit to have a spare, but I mean, the problem, if we don't do it, we're going to be really jammed up next year. Well, the way I'm looking at it is you're going to have a hard time filling that position this year, it sounds. That's probably likely, yes. So if you got rid of the truck that's falling apart in the parking lot and the spare, you're still going to have a spare cruiser. I'll still have a spare. That's right. That, that is correct. Yep. And then next year you can uh, focus more on filling that that position and having a spare cruiser if we end up getting this cruiser or another one next year to replace that one. So do we? Okay. <clears throat> What would that end up? How many how many police vehicles would we have under Bob's scenario? Right now, yeah, four. So once we get rid of two, we'd have four. Yes. Okay. We currently have three employees that need cruisers, and you're looking for the fourth one. And I have a part time that's pretty close to coming. So, I I mean I've started the background on this person, so this person would potentially be available for as long as not as that is a position that could be filled sooner. And you're not interested in doing hot seats. You don't think that works? We can't do hot seats because we take call at night. Okay. Hot seats you'd be leaving the cars here. We'd right. have to drive from our house, clear our personal vehicles. Well off. no, I mean if you have four officers you don't leave your house. You've got somebody in that car. No. You still yeah. take call at night. Well, maybe you do take a call at night, but I would think, you know, you'd have cars enough so that if you've got a part-time officer, that guy's going to be on call. Or some other officer with a car is going to be on call. You don't have to have the whole department on call. 
And yeah, I know you don't have the whole department on call. So That's correct. Who's on call has a car at home. But that means we have to jockey cars around it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, no I, I know the, I know what you'd have to do to do it. It's whether or not it would work, if it was a workable solution. That's all. So without a spare, we're still in the same box. Well, but by Bob's scenario, there is a spare until we hire somebody. Right. But. Give me guidance, Mr. Chairman. Well, Bob made a motion, but it didn't get seconded. Does Bob wish to make a new motion, including the fact that we're going to get rid of two cruises to buy one? Would you be amenable to that, Chief? <clears throat> sure. I would make a motion that if the Chief gets rid of the spare, the current spare cruiser, and the one that he deems uh, not roadworthy, uh, that we give him uh, the authority to move forward with the purchase of the previous said motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Is there any further discussion? With the only question I had with that way that's worded, because the new one would come before it wouldn't be set up for a while, and we'd have to. Some of the equipment might be swapped over. My point is, I don't want to get rid of the vehicles prior to the new one coming. No, I'm not, one. I'm, not <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. You need to have um, workable vehicles right now. Yeah. And until the new one comes online, I think that once you get the new one online, the other two go up for sale. Yeah, that's fine. I just want to be clear on that. So we've had a motion and a second, and the horse has been beaten to its knees. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. I'd say order it up. Okay. The last thing under action items, finally, the Lakes Region Planning Commission has announced that it will have its annual meeting and awards ceremony June 26th at the Winnipesaukee Ballroom at Mills Falls Church Landing in beautiful Meredith, New Hampshire. And they've included a nomination for a person of the year kind of thing which I had already sent, and Cammy had written a letter for us. So that pretty well covers that. All right, correspondence. We've done the memo from Chief Shigari. The Parks and Rec Committee sent us a memo that they're gonna have a fundraising event, so to speak, and uh, pretty much a lasagna dinner at Camp Sentinel, Saturday, May 6th at uh, 5 to 7 p.m. up at Sentinel Lodge. And reservations are through Eventbrite, and that will be for the first 50 people who register. Donations are welcome. And you talk about the fundraiser that you're trying to do, and that's correspondence. You can read it in detail. The Life Ministries Food Pantry thanks us for our generous donation. The Red Cross thanks us for our generous donation. Executive Council District 1, Mr. Joe Kenny, has sent us the uh, highlights and uh, items approved that impact District 1, none of which seem to impact Tufton Bro. As near as I can tell, feel free to read that at your leisure. We have the library statistics, informative as always. And we have a standard dredge and fill wetlands permit application that's been through the Conservation Commission. It involves tearing down a breakwater, rebuilding it, and putting in an L-shaped, what I'll call a dock, for lack of a better term. All in correspondence. That being done. Selectman's updates. Who wants to go first? No, I'll go first. Um, it looks like uh, we may be getting a, a reappointments uh, in short order for uh, two people on our planning board. Uh, Gary and Tony are up this year, and they both indicated they, that, that they wish to uh, stay on board. And uh, we also had a discussion at the planning board meeting uh, last week. It was, a, it was a work session. 
that uh, a lot of towns around the lake, a lot of towns in New Hampshire, any, anywhere that there's uh, a lot of short-term lodging, um, Airbnbs and that type, they're adopting ordinances to help regulate um, short-term lodging. And it's more, they're more about life safety, noise, parking, uh, not overstuffing them with people, uh, that type of thing. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion, pros and cons, on the planning board, and uh, they asked me to come to the selectmen and ask if we could get a consensus, if that is something that the selectmen think that we really should pursue. Um, do the selectmen feel that we need a short-term lodging ordinance, or should we just uh, let things kind of go as they are. Um, I have a sample, uh, a modified sample of an ordinance that was presented if you, if you guys wish to, to take a look at it. Certainly don't need to look at it tonight or decide tonight, but uh, it's something that uh, you should probably ponder and, and offer an opinion to the planning board. There's pros and cons. And uh, I'm, looking, I'm looking at it more for a liability from the town's point. Um, if there's a fire and somebody dies, um, could the town have done something to prevent it by enacting an ordinance that, uh, that a lot of towns are enacting, that type of thing? Um, I don't think we want to get into um, over-regulating, overstepping our bounds, but uh, I, think, I think we should uh, at least present the question to our town attorney and uh, see what her opinion is, whether we should have one or not for a liability standpoint. Right. And I think it's not unlike the question that we had with the road agent vis-a-vis -vis closing the roads and, and setting up a system where people actually have a little receipt for having permission to go on a closed road. We've had issues in the past with um, Airbnb down on the lake being overpopulated for whatever senior night or whatever mm -hmm. high school seniors, not old people. Um, I know that I finally have had some issues with it. My biggest issue with it is that they're not paying any rooms and meals tax. And I'm not certain why that is. We get an awful lot of revenue from that on an annual basis. There's no inspection process for fire safety, for instance. Or, um, that's another thing. I don't mean to interrupt, but um, that's another inspection is going to be an issue. Um, there'd be a lot of properties. I can't imagine there'd be less than a couple hundred properties that uh, would qualify for this um, permitting process, so to speak. Right. And the burden would be put on Jack and, uh, and the fire chief to inspect these either annually or uh, every two two years or something like that, whatever we came up with. So their input would be um, right. monumental. I mean, it's like any other permit. I mean, it's like a gas permit or mm -hmm. whatever building permit you want to do an electrical permit. There's a fee involved. Mm -hmm. I think there should be, if you get into this, there should be a fee. If you want to get into business, it's going to cost you. I mean, not an exorbitant amount of money, but so we have some idea who's doing what. Yep. And I think it doesn't, it's not just the small camp owners, there's some big camp owners out there in Tufts Burnett that are renting their whole house. And, you know, there has to be, I mean, I, I, I worry, as you were worrying, that if something dramatic were to happen, is the time level for inactivity. So, but I think we ought to run that by the attorneys. Yeah, yeah, definitely. For we, well, we can't write an ordinance ourselves. I mean, right. That would work in that situation. Well, planning board is already working on um, on a draft. And um, that draft clearly would be forwarded to the to, to the I think first we'd send it to our planning board uh, consultant, right. and then um, send that consultant's draft to the attorney. Um, it's 
Speaking of that consultant, is that a, a person who might help us with the town administration work? Or is that not something that person does? I don't know, but it never hurts to ask. Okay, that would be nice to ask that question. Um, would it be, would, would the board permit me to consult with the town attorney on, on this matter? Yeah, if you have a draft that the, the planning board has approved, Obviously, it's got to run by. <clears throat> we haven't. We don't. We just have. Uh, we have a working draft. Nothing's been approved, and uh, we there was so much back and forth discussion last Thursday night that we kind of put the brakes on and said, you know, we got to go to the selectmen and see if they actually want us to do this, and if so, we need to um, probably right. present it to town attorney. So, what I would like to do is at least uh, send a fire off an email to uh, Lara. Right. And ask if this is a direction that we should, uh, a road that we should travel. What's the upside? What's the downside? I yeah, think. right, exactly. Because I'm sure they have towns that are, in the, I mean, Conway's in the middle of it. I don't know. They don't represent Conway. And, uh, and then, based on that opinion, um, I'm, I'm confident she's going to tell us yes, but uh, still, I'd, I'd like to have the discussion. I'm listening. <laughs> right. I'll start with, that, start with that question. There's only one way to find out. All right. Uh, that's it for my update. Um, Bob was good enough to give me a lead on um, the Sandwich Alliance for Solar Power. Did you talk to them? I did. I talked to three different people. Um, good group of guys, huh? They, yeah, they're interesting. They tried the same thing that we tried, which was to get a solar facility put on the warrant and were not successful. The uh, selectmen wouldn't recommend it, the budget committee wouldn't recommend it. Um, and for all the reasons that came up during our meetings with the budget committee, and you know, I explained to them what we did to hopefully work through that, that's to get the $30,000 put on, a, on the warrant. But he did get, they did give me names for different designers who they've worked with on this project. Um, I also talked to a representative from the New Hampshire Electric Co-op. So Sandwich, it was, it surprised me. They, they were planning on a power purchase agreement or a partnership with the co-op because of an unwillingness to get into a borrowing the money to put this together. So it, it seemed odd that they didn't have the ability to just buy it. But the power purchase agreements that I've seen from them weren't any better than the ones that were presented for our perusal from our different suppliers. Yeah, they want to make money too. They want to make all the money. I mean, it's, it's <coughs> worth like three or four thousand bucks a year. Doesn't make any sense, but at any rate, I also put together two packets because I have two individuals who want to sit down and help me put together a RFQ, if you will, for these providers. I spoke again with Norwich. We need to get over a 200k facility before they're interested in, in doing the job, and I also spoke with. Um, I forget the name, it's, it's Sun something, who I've forwarded our um, query to. So I'm hoping that we end up with four solid desire to work with us and then we'll put, it, put the RFQ together and tell them exactly what we want to do. But maybe talking with Sandwich and, and talking about the rate structure that they were given by New Hampshire Electric Co-op, we may be looking at 150 being a better mark than 100, but we'll see. And I haven't had that meeting with the co-op either, and the co-op was going to have a, a real meeting with Sandwich if they'd gotten their warrant together, but they didn't, so um, we're all working on the same direction. Right. Well, Very similar. That's encouraging, anyway. Yeah, 
Yeah, definitely. They had a lot more information on storage and stuff that I had no idea what they were talking about. But we're going to meet physically sometime in June, I think. So appreciate you being here. I think that was all I did. Well, if you come up with something, we'll, we'll be able to come back well, to well, it. I might come up with it next week. I don't know. Sure. Okay, uh, met with the Conservation Commission. They have a new revised route for the trail entry and exit at Central Park, which basically just draws the line around the cell tower boundary line. It's very simple. But they solved that problem by just rerouting it. It was pretty easy. No bridge building needed? No bridge building needed. They're continuing their work uh, towards having the open house, so to speak, at the uh, Great Meadow Trail and Observation Platform in June, as, they, as we have talked about before. Uh, they noted that the beaver are back and they're going to have to build a few more little, uh, I'll call them boardwalks, over some wet areas uh, and working on designing a wraparound trail that does the lower end of that former Lions property. Continuing to monitor 19 Mile Brook. That's high on the list. <coughs> what, what they note, and, and this is more for the public than it is for you guys because you already know, but the company that Wolfro uses to test does a go no go test. It's either good or it isn't. When the Conservation Commission has their samples tested, they get exact amounts or as close as you can get so that they can follow a trend and see if something's happening. And uh, that's been a concern right along. Former Wolfboro Public Works Director David Ford is involved. Now that he no longer works for Wolfboro, he seems to have concerns about uh, the monitoring of 19 Mile Brook and the rapid infiltration basins. Imagine that. I don't have to. I see it. <laughs> I've had a, brought Timmy a, a proposition that we put a stop sign at the intersection of Cross Neck Road and Tuftonboro Neck Road and a big bold white line because people tend to roll through and uh, they've had some close calls up there. Especially with people turning left for some reason, people coming from the right that are going straight. Uh, so who, some, would, who would stop? Who would stop? In a T-shaped intersection? The people in the... People on the neck should stop. Very people simple. on the cross neck road would stop? No, the people on the neck road would stop. It look both ways instead of just wheeling over to the left. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Right. That, that was a suggestion. Something we could talk to the road agent about. I think we, if they want to put a stop sign up there, we put three stop signs, not one. Well, and they'll just sit there for, for hours. <laughs> well, that happens to work at, at Bay Street, <laughs> Browning Road, and Mill Street. Uh, but we'll talk to the road agent about it, eh? See what he thinks. In uh, our secretary's updates and want to know uh, if we're going to discuss the proposal for the change in transfer station hours again. Uh, I took the liberty of checking this out. Well, I had them anyway because I have them on a slip because we work all around, but Ossipi's uh, transfer station is open on Sunday from 8 to 1, Wolfboro on Sunday from 7.30 to 2.30, and Moultonboro Sunday 1 to 5. So the towns around us do have Sunday operational hours. That's something to consider. And we're open? We're open. Eight to four? Eight to four. So the discussion would be shortening those hours? You could shorten the hours, but with having three full-time people, uh, I think three per diems, and a part-time superintendent, I tend to think that for a man to have a Sunday off wouldn't be all that hard, or even two. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, personally, I would wait to see if uh, the Superintendent comes back with a schedule that, that fits better. And on that note, we have a note from the tax collector who says, just a little side note, I read the draft of the selectman's minutes and Chris was proposing that there be no recycling on Sundays, exclamation point. People have their rituals, and if they always come on Sunday for one reason or another, and the recycling is not open, then the compactor will fill up pretty fast. They're not going to come another day. The full-time employees could alternate weekend days off. I agree with that statement. All right. We, I met with the newly formed Agricultural Commission, all three of us. Uh, it was a good meeting. We're, uh, uh, what do I want to call that? Looking for people. <laughs> Definitely. We're all 
also really investigating the IRS agent and what the, the purpose of the commission is. Mm -hmm. So the next time we meet, we'll have more on that. And along that line, we have a note from the tax collector about the town garden or the community garden. Now, if you'd like, it says the gardeners are all set. They're all on board with doing things themselves. They've got most of the chips spread, the hoses out, water's on, no leaks. Some of the bee garden cleaned up, etc. But they need a new wheelbarrow. They think the Agricultural Commission should buy them a wheelbarrow. Uh, now, correct me if my recollection of this is wrong, but when the tax collector came in, she said that, that the town garden didn't, was not going to be in the purview, wasn't in the purview, I should say, of the Agricultural Commission, and uh, we allowed them to go ahead and do things on their own. To that note, RSA 6744-44-G says, a town or city having established an agricultural commission under this subdivision may appropriate money as deemed necessary to carry out its purposes. The whole or any part of money so appropriated in any year and any gifts of money received pursuant to RSA 674-44-F shall be placed in an agricultural fund and allowed to accumulate from one year to year. So we actually have a budget line for it, but in coming years, we can actually create a fund, and any money's not spent or brought in can be put in that fund and kept from year to year. Well, which brings me to the interesting point that the uh, totals for the garden plots this year were $2,032. But that was put in the general fund. Why couldn't that be put into the fund? It could be. You have to establish one. Yeah, we do have to establish a fund. You have to take it before the voters. Yes. So it's not the, no different than the uh, yep. parks, and parks and rides. Any of that. But it, could, it should be done, I would think. Yeah. And, that, and then that money, rather than going in the general fund, could be put in that fund and actually used for an agricultural purpose. And I'd be a lot more amenable to buying them a wheelbarrow if they put that money in there. But the Agricultural Commission will have to decide. Because the next section says uh, uh, that the town treasurer shall have custody of all monies in the Agricultural Fund and pay out the same only upon order of the Agricultural Commission. So there we stand. So you know for a fact that that money went into the general fund? This is from the tax collector. And it has been going into the general fund? Right along. Right along. Yes. So there is money in the budget in the Agricultural Yes, there is. $675. Right, so I'm going to make a motion that um, you guys buy a wheelbarrow for the garden. Us guys, not you. What that? You guys, meaning us, not you. Yeah, the uh, agricultural commission. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Well, what are you going to do with the money in your agricultural commission budget? Well, once we've actually determined what our purpose is, for example, mm -hmm. We can have people come in, for example, there's a fellow who farms goats in town. Give a lecture on goat farming. Someone may want to do that. We could have the beekeepers come in. There may be more people excited about bees. None of this will be free, I'm sure. That's a start. In the meantime, recruitment is our big issue, as you know. And now you have a wheelbarrow to help recruit. <laughs> <laughs> and you will have the garden back. I mean, talk to your tax collector. She, will, will I talked to her at length about it. And the problem that she was having, given all the um, politics involved, was she had it all set for this year, and she didn't want to be messing with it, which is the way she is. But on further discussion, it wasn't, I'm going to run the garden forever. No, it was, we needed to get it going for this year, and then if the Agricultural Commission, which was not existing at that point, right. Wants to take it or as purview over it, then that, that's the way it will go. Wonderful. I mean, I don't see it as a big argument next year. No, I don't either. And I, think, and I think we've already moved in that direction. Yeah. Now, I received a phone call as I drove in today <laughs> from one of the ladies who was on this uh, committee that wants to place a carved stone chair down at the town beach in memory of Jerry, and I cannot remember her name to save my soul. What we need to do with that is uh, get together with Dennis, go down and look at the proposed location, and then I would think, bring it to the Board of Selectmen for our approval to place that memorial chair in that location. So my plan is 
to try to get together with Dennis and this lady uh, in the next week or two, figure out where it's going to go, bring it here for approval. That's all I have for updates. Anything else on Selectman's updates? Then we're scheduled to do a non-public session or two, and that will mean that. Good to see you, Fran. Thank you. Good night, Fran. Night. I'd like to make a motion to go in non-public uh, 91A-A-3, but I'm not sure which one is personnel. But we'll do personnel first and let the chief do his. Okay, I'll second. All right. Pike, aye. Murray, aye. Aldi, aye. Yeah. So 